listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair on RLM Radio. The girl of your dreams has got to be in some bar. Sorry, boys and girls, but this is X-rated. So if you're under 18... Get out, God damn it! Get the point good. And now... Fend Y'all ready for this? We do it all night long. And now, your host, Grammy. Hi there, ho there, everybody, and guess what? It is a wacka 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 doodle Wednesday here on reallibertymedia.com, channel 10, even. <laughs> and yeah, we're discussing colors over here in the chat. And yeah, I, I change colors all the time. I don't know what the hell for. Um, But Grimmy, I like the color that you are today much better because you were a bright yellow the other day and it was really hard for me to read you. But eh, I like I like this color. It's easier for me to read. And Dawn is brown. (laughs) Are you are you a UPS guy, Dawn, or is that for another kind of brown? Um, I'm getting kind of. Yeah, because it's been warm, and I've been working out in the garden. By the way, thank you, Soikles, for the garden song. (laughs) I really like that song. Um, But yeah, I'm really turning into Neapolitan ice cream. I've got quite a bit of chocolate going on, and then I still got the vanilla area, and the... (laughs) And, and I got some some strawberry areas, too, because I was out just a little bit too long. <laughs> Oopsie. Oh, well. <clears throat> yeah, this is Grammy's Weed Whacker Wednesday. Hey, yeah. Well, I don't have a weed whacker. Well, I do, but I need to charge the battery up in it. I mowed yesterday, though, and it's drying a popcorn fart out here. Let me tell you. And the wind has been blowing for the last few days, and so that means a lot of dust has been blowing in. So, yeah. Remember Pigpen from the Charlie Brown cartoons that's what I looked like (laughs) I would get on my riding mower and I'd be puttering around and next thing you know here's this here she comes in a cloud of dust um (laughs) oh well yeah okay yeah what do I need to say yeah this is Grammy's rocket chair (laughs) Here on reallibertymedia.com, channel 10. I got my own channel. Woo woo! We're also on the Spreaker, the RLM Spreaker channel and RLM uh, tune in radio station and internet radio station, and later to be on the YouTube channel and the BitChute channel. Oh, yeah, and RLM radio.xyz as well. As well. So, um, Don, that's because brown is what can brown do for you. <laughs> oh, those funny, funny commercials. And I used to give the UPS guy shit all the time because I would see him every day because we were a UPS. Um, oh, you're not listening, Don? See how you are. You brat. <laughs> that's okay. Now I can really give you shit. <laughs> brown, shit. Okay. Let me see. Where am I? I don't know. I'm lost. I'm alone. I'm crazy. I'm crazy, I tell you. Okay, over here on Mines. I don't know what's going on over here on Mines. I did not... Did Yeah. It's been a day. In any case, but I did find this lovely meme that the strike shared earlier, and I just love it. We should remove all taxes and make the government request funding through a crowdsourcing page. I think that would be just absolutely splendiferous. And let's see how much uh, nonsense they can get up to that way. Of course, I saw another one earlier about, um, oh, what was it, Uh, on Twitter. Something about, um, if you're such a despicable person that uh, you know you're a truly despicable person when you need to make laws or make it illegal for people to disrespect or talk down about you. And it's like, ooh, I, ooh, yeah. Wow, there's a lot of those. Hey, I lost a stalker. I must have turned a corner a little bit sharp. Cool. What is this? Nuge, the Nuge. I'm a big fan of Donald Trump because I believe in bold, aggressive, unapologetic truth. I do too, sweetheart, but that doesn't mean that I'm a fan of the Trumple Stillskin. 
And, you know, sometimes Trump will still skin is just plain obnoxious. I think just because he can be, because he can get away with it. But, you know, that's, that's Trump will sing. Whatever. In any case, thank you, Grimner and Barman, for tweeting me out over there on Twitter. I truly do appreciate it. Hey, Vinny, I see you was over here earlier today, too. And BB9. Hi, BB. How are you doing, sweetheart? Long time no chitty chat. We need to chat. You know, I'm still using that homemade soap recipe that you gave me years ago back on World Truth. It's the bomb. I've adjusted it just a skosh. But other than that, you know, it's cool. I love it. I love it. And I save a shit ton of money because I'm not having to go and buy that damn stuff from the grocery store. Okay, over here on Fakey Book, I see my daughters on here and some nieces are on here. And, uh, let's see, who else? Weeda! Hi, Weeda! How are you doing, sweetheart? Oh, and in a family section, we were, my sister was discussing how nasty her doggies' poots were. You know, and how loud they were, and I, I had to inform her that at least she got some kind of warning, because my bubba gifted me with two SBDs yesterday. And usually it was right after I sat down and was getting ready to have a drink of my beverage. And he laid down on the floor right by my feet so I couldn't run away. <laughs> and it's like, oh my lord. Dude, seriously. And I knew it was not me because I went, Bubba. And he looked at me and he gave me this kind of look like, well, I feel better. <laughs> Doggies doggies the dog really did do it this time really did okay so i've been to mines i've been to twitter i've been to facebook let's go check out that effing site that freedoms network um arian has joined us something about over on ip which i'm going to assume that's informed planet may not be around for much longer i hope they stick around I really, really enjoy going over there, Jules. I just don't go very often anymore. I'm, I don't I don't go anywhere very often anymore except for out in the yard and do the radio. So thank you, Grimmy, for sharing me over here on this F side. I also see the lovely Estrella is here. And uh, let's see, who else is loitering around here? Me and Grim and Estrella and Bobby and Loki Luck. Sweet. Quite a few people over here. Awesome, awesome. And if you are a member of Freedoms Network, please consider donating to uh, help keep, you know, with server fees and everything, keep the site alive. We would truly appreciate it. On the stand for true. Okay. And now that I've been to one, two three four i've been to those and twitter too i've been to twitter too okay it's time to go to the place where you need to be if you want to give me static yeah over here on the rlm just think of a nickname join the chat give me some shit i'll give it back yeah or maybe not you know unless you you use my name grams with a z then you know because i get a little flasher thingy i get flashed every time someone talks to me <laughs> And it's like, woohoo, somebody's flashing. Now I'm flashing. Woohoo. Um, okay. Hi, Dawn. Yeah, build a spaceship. Woohoo. Um, dun, dun, dun. Okay. I'm reading. Oh, Dawn is going to be our savior. I'm catching up on the chat. Ooh, 12 days to FN expiry. Yes. Yes. We need to do something. We need to do something. Yeah, the 23rd of July. Also, there's a full moon the end of July as well. Or not a full moon. A, a total lunar eclipse. But you can't see it from USA. Sorry. You're SOL. Okay. Let's see. Oil as a fuel. Really? Yeah, I know. Oil as a fuel in 2018. Well, that's because there's douchebags that seem to think that they want to continue making money off of that and the hell with the rest of us. And yes, it is barbaric. But over here in the RLM chat, right up top, I see Barman, the most... Oh, Grimmy's flashing me. Who, baby? <laughs> 
Yeah, Barman's the most splendiferous bop, but Grimmy's flashy. <laughs> Not quite as flashy as Flasteroid, because, well, you know, it takes quite a bit to be as flashy as Flasteroid. Because, yeah, I put that oid on there for a reason. <laughs> Love you, Flashers. Okay, uh, let's see. Yeah, Barman Grimner, the lovely Moose Girl. I saw she joined in just a little bit ago. I also see the lovely Kate is in the house. Hey, Kate. I see that you have been paying, you and Rome's have been paying very close attention and keeping me updated on the little ones and the scuba divers and the cave rescue and all that other fun stuff. So good job. Thank you guys. You're doing an awesome job of keeping me updated on that. Uh, let's see. Whoa. Wait a minute. Huh? Whacker doodle. Who? Feeding him the wrong. Oh, actually, Don, um, Bubba had an intestinal issue and then he ate a critter and, um, it, yeah. So he's, he's on the mend now, but whoa, it was not a pleasant aroma. No, it was not. But yeah, he's, I, I feed my doggies the good stuff. You know, the, the, n none of that weird shit added into kind of stuff. Um, I'm awake fully now. Oh, hey, Poxified, I see you chiming in. Okay, back to Asmo. Hi, Asmo. How are you doing? And Chalcedonia's in the chat. Got a double dip and a Chloe going on. And the second Chloe's got an extra E because she's going E. Free Enslaved is here. Hey, Free. How are you doing, hon? I'm here, kind of, sort of, maybe. I also see I be Doncy and I be Doncy Woike is here. He's an overachiever. Java, 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 Java Doctor 2 is in the house. Oil is for lubrication. Oh, lube. <laughs> move along, Grammy. Move along. Good God. Hmm. El Dorado? Ooh. My brother had a seven, I don't remember what year El Dorado he had. I have a brother that had one. Moving along. JJ's. Hi, JJ's. How are you doing, sweetheart? My Scottish feller. I also see Juana Taco is in the house. Hey, Juana. How you doing, hon? I don't know what I'm fixing for supper yet, but every time I see your name, I think, God, what am I doing for supper? Uh, Meister Brower. Woody. Yay, Woody's back amongst the chatters. I also see the lovely rain is in the house. We are expecting rain, or they are projecting rain. Let's put it that way, um, here in the next couple of days. And that would be really, really nice. Really nice, because it is drier than a popcorn fart out here. Um, Let's see, RLM Fluke is in the house. Hey, Fluky. I saw that you joined just in time, sweetheart. Thank you ever so much. I know she's a bot. Don't tell me. Bots have feelings, too. Because I watched that person of interest. I watched the whole series of person of interest on Netflix. It was really kind of interesting. There were, there were times where it kind of lagged, and I kind of went, do I really want to finish watching this? But yeah, I did. I did. I think it was five seasons or six, something like that took me about a month but ah it was cool um and yes the machine had a pro poisonality as well in that okay rob works who fired up the bubbler a couple of times i believe thank you rob everybody needs a little bit of a bubbler going on except for my bubba because he's woo. he hasn't done any more today but yesterday wow uh, Rome's is here. Hey, Rome's. How are you, sweetie? I also see, I wish you were Darth Rome's, but, eh, you know, it's your thing. You do what you gotta do. Phantom, the phantom of the chat. He is quite the phantom, too. He stays logged in, but he never chitty chats anymore. Colfax 101 is here, as well as Death Spawn. Ooh, uh. And looky there, Frumpy and Gooberzilla. We're going to space with Gooberzilla. I'm in space right now. I'm in outer space because anything that's outer of my skin is outer space. It is space outer my body. Canary yellow. Sweet. Okay. I don't want canary yellow. Oh, Rob. Damn. Mm. That's a bright color, honey. 
uh, Frumpy Goober Kozu. Hi, Kozu. How are you, hon? You, you're also one of those strong silent types. Moy, 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 moy is here. And wow, we got lots of poxes going on in the chitty chat. Got a pox enslaved, a pox free, poxified, poxophone, and poxy home. Lots of poxes in the boxes. I also see pom 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 sauce and sock puppet. Hi, sock puppet. I gave my granddaughter a sock puppet, one of them sock monkey sock puppet thingies. She was just so excited. And to round out the crew, the one, the only, the F Bominator, Skittle. Hi, Skittle. I know you're a bot too, but bots have feelings. Okay. Oh, wow. You had a big caddy. I had, what was that, a 62. Two or a '64 Chrysler New Yorker, you know, with the shifter on the on the dash, you know, with the slide thingy and the push button. God, I love that car, and uh, drove it to the courthouse. No, it wasn't the courthouse. It was to the hospital. Yeah, I was going to see my grandma. Drove it to see my grandma, and it's it had an electrical fire and I had to call the fire department and by the time they got there and got it put out which really our fire department is pretty fast um yeah it was going to cost way more to uh, try and repair the damage than the car was worth mm, I was very sad I really liked that old boat and it was a boat but I tell you what you got on the highway and it was like a dream you just floated down the road at about 90 <laughs> I like that car yeah and maybe it's a good thing I don't have it because I do have a bit of a lead foot so okay where do I want to go first hmm what to do what to do do I want to go there or want to go I have multiple things that are already open. Um, that's messed up. That's messed up. Um, I think, well, do I want to go? Because, yeah, life really is kind of a fantasy anyway. You know, and it's and it's all made up. It's all make-believe. It's all what somebody else thinks inside their mind. And a lot of times you get to deal with their um, reactions and interactions. Uh, let's see. You know a society is brainwashed when more people care about who will be eliminated from a TV show than being eliminated from existence. You know, that is true. Thank you, Trutherbot, for that one. Yeah. It is a sad, sad, sad world. And a lot of people just flat ass don't realize that, I mean, stop and think about this. When you go to the polls and you vote for who you think you're going to be putting in as Popo, it's a popularity contest. It's no different than voting for um, homecoming king and queen, basically. That's all you're doing. And it, even that, I think, was probably rigged. But <clears throat> although the gal that got homecoming king and queen my senior year or got queen, I don't remember who was it. Oh, yeah, I can't remember his name, but I can see him. In any case, she was really awesome. She was a sweet gal, Dee Dee. She was just so awesome, and it didn't change her. She did not get all uppity and snooty and stuff, and she everybody loved her. And <clears throat> The girl that got uh, Snowball Queen, she was such a pretty little thing and so sweet and so shy. But once she got Snowball Queen, she became very snooty patootie. And so, yeah, sometimes that can change you and that's not a good thing. Okay, so I know rambling on. I think I'm going to go ahead and close Twitter now. Thank you, Twitter, for the few little things that you have given me this evening. Um, dun, dun. Do I want to go? Yeah. Yeah. I will go with Monopoly first. I think I will go with Monopoly. Yes, I will do Monopoly. Okay, so. <clears throat> excuse me. This is from allthingsinteresting.com. And according to them, at least. Elizabeth Maggie... I'm not sure if I pronounced that properly or not. 
uh, the inventor of Monopoly who tried to teach us progressive econ or yeah, economic ideas. So, apparently the inventor of Monopoly designed the game to reveal the dangers of land grabbing, but we all learned the wrong lesson from it. Yeah, because if you were the biggest land grabber, you were the winner. Chicken dinner. Although it's a nasty chicken dinner, like one of them TV dinner things. Eee. At least what they've become. TV dinners back in the day didn't used to be so horrible bad. Not so much anymore. In any case, she may be the inventor of Monopoly, but few know the name Elizabeth Maggie today. And what's more, the progressive e economic message that inspired the classic board game is now all but forgotten as well. So this is a little known story of the board game that tried to teach us the dangers of land grabbing but then became something entirely different. Elizabeth was born in Illinois in 1866, just after the end of the Civil War, and her father, James Maggie, was a newspaper publisher who had traveled around Illinois with Abraham Lincoln in the 1850s, while the future president was engaged in his now famous debates with political rival Stephen Douglas. Now, James became a rather popular and fiery public speaker himself, an ability his daughter would proudly inherit. As she recalled, I have often been called a chip off the old block, which I consider quite a compliment. A, comp a confident uh, rhetorician, I did not know that was even a word, uh, young Elizabeth, <coughs> excuse me, took a rather unique path for a woman in the late 1800s. Rather than trying to find a husband as soon as possible, she actually did not marry until she was 44. She worked as a stenographer by day and by night performed in comedies on stage, where she reportedly drew huge laughs from the crowds. Her father influenced not just her penchant for public performance, but her politics as well. James had run for office and lost on an anti-monopoly ticket in Illinois in the years soon after the Civil War, the, although the exact date is not clear. Furthermore, James gave his daughter a copy of economist George or Henry George's 1879 book, Progress and Poverty another anti-monopolist influence that had decided or had a decided impact on young Elizabeth Maggie. Now George theorized that although people should be able to own anything they created, land belonged to everyone and no one person should be able to profit from owning it. He proposed abolishing all taxes except for what would be a single tax that would only be imposed upon idle landowners. Now given her creative background, Elizabeth came up with the idea for a board game that would make George's idea accessible to the public. <clears throat> Excuse me, and it was called the Landlord's Game. So, as the inventor of Monopoly herself once said, her new board game was a practical demonstration of the present system of land grabbing with all its usual outcomes and consequences. What's more, it was partly a protest of the big name American monopolists who, at the time, held a great deal of the country's wealth in their own personal grips, such as steel tycoon Andrew Carnegie and oil baron John D. Rockefeller. Now, Elizabeth's original 1904 version of the game, which she dubbed the Landlord's Game, differed quite a bit from the Monopoly game that is so popular today. Instead of circling the board, trying to collect as much property as possible, players of Maggie's game could play under two different sets of rules. The Monopolist rules, which resembled the modern version of the game, set the end goal of building monopolies and crushing opponents, while the anti-monopolist rules rewarded all the players when wealth was generated. 
Now, two different ways the game could be played were meant to demonstrate that the creation of wealth from which all could benefit was a superior economic system to one that allows monopolies. The, real <clears throat> the game's real objective could be found in its instructions. In 1920, the 1924 version of which stated the game's objective was not only amusement, but to illustrate to the players how under the present system of land tenure, the landlord has an advantage over other enterprises. So, although, <clears throat> excuse me, although the landlord's game was popular among left-wing academics, it never really gained traction among the general public. Even though Maggie revised the patent four different versions of the game. And it wasn't until inventor Charles Darrow came to Parker Brothers with his own modified version of the game in 1935 that it really took off. The company bought the rights to Maggie's game, potentially to head off any copyright lawsuits, for $500. And although she received no royalties, Parker Brothers did also promise to produce a few hundred of the original Landlord's game as well. However, of course, it was the monopolistic version of the game and not Maggie's anti-monopolist version of the game that became popular. And so she made virtually no money from it. So... In 1936 interview piece with Maggie, uh, with the Evening Star, they wrote that if the sub subtle propaganda for the single tax idea works around to the mind of the thousands who now shake the dice and buy and sell all over the Monopoly board, she feels the whole business will not have been in vain. And in some ways then, her efforts may not have been in vain. As of the game's 80th anniversary in 2015, more than 275 million copies of Monopoly have been sold to players all over the world. But just how many of those players have actually thought about the anti-monopolist message of the game's origins while rolling the dice and having fun? Well, We'll never know. So, that would be, I would like to be able to look at the original set of rules to the Landlord's Games. That would be kind of cool. Oh, and I saw that. Okay. I will go there. I saw that earlier. Frumpy about the maps how frickin deranged is that trying to get that shit to where it's and I know I started reading an article about it um, and yes Grimmy social socialism is no fun but eh, any kind of ism I'm not real cool on Not even atheism, because atheism implies that there is a certain set of rules. When actually, if you are an atheist, a true atheist, the only rules you have are your rules. So, one rule. Or not atheist. What was what was I? Anarchist, not atheist. Good God, Gertie. See, it's a wackadoodle Wednesday. I was thinking of them damn maps things, and it's like, ah. Uh. Okay. Here we go. This it was from the Daily Caller. I saw this the other day, and I kept keep seeing memes and all that other fun stuff. And since you brought it up, Frumpy, um. So, pedophiles believe that they should be part of the LGBT community. Well, you know, I don't know that the LGBT community would really wish to have you. Um, oh, come on. Give me, don't give me this shit. Assholes. Kiss my ass. So, the Daily Caller wants me to whitelist this freaking article. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to read it from my pocket and the hell with them. 
So, from the dailycaller.com, pedophiles are rebranding themselves as maps or minor attracted persons in an effort to gain acceptance and be included into the LGBT community. This is according to the Urban Dictionary, and the blanket term MAP includes infantophiles, pedophiles, um, hebophiles, which is pubescent, okay, infantophiles is infants, pedophiles is prepubescent children, um, hebophiles is uh, pubescent children, and ephibophiles, eph really, postpubescent children. Okay, so some maps also refers, refer to themselves as no maps or non-offending minor attracted persons. And these pedophiles seek to be part of the LGBT plus community, even going so far as to make a pride flag for pri Gay Pride Month. Now, <clears throat> the map slash no map community tries to pull at people's heartstrings by claiming that pedophiles are misunderstood, marginalized people. And that as long as their attraction to children is not acted upon, or in some cases when they get permission from the child, that they should not be villainized. Okay, number one, these are children. And whether they look grown up or not physically, or even if they start acting grown up. Trust me, I got two 14-year-old granddaughters. I know how this shit rolls. I had two daughters. I know how this shit works. Just because you act more grown up, not necessarily mature, but more grown up, does not mean that you are emotionally ready for some of the shit y'all are trying to pull. So, do not be, yeah, this shit of, oh, but I had permission from the child. Really? Really? Well, sites, su sites such as Prevention Project claim to be aimed at helping children, posting quotes like the ones below, which reminisce, uh, reminiscent of testimonials of struggling gay youth under headlines like, Everyone Needs Support. You know, stuff like, John was suicidal. He'd been bullied by trolls on social media for most of his life for being different. The bullies were primarily people who claimed, based on their religious belief, that John was going to hell and deserved to die. They described how they would kill him on his Twitter page, and people supported their hate. Desperate for help, John sought treatment for his shame, depression, and suicidality. And although he was scared to share about himself with a stranger, he felt desperate for help as he had no desire to harm anyone, ever. Once he shared about his attraction to children, his therapist told him, I don't treat sex offenders. Okay. Now the therapist, bad juju on you, dude. John, if you really are a real person, although I'm sure this kind of shit happens all the time, Social media does not mean share every little personal iota of yourself out there in the ethernet for everyone and their dog to see forevermore. Because once you put it out there, it never goes away. Ever. You know, so although he was scared to share about himself with a stranger, honey, you put that kind of information out there on the interwebs, and you're sharing it with some people that are a hell of a lot stranger than you might believe. I'm pretty strange myself, but there are lots of people that are stranger than me. And going by the other definition of stranger, they are all strangers to you because every damn one of them, every damn one of us, anyone that engages in any kind of social activity on the interwebs only puts out there what they want you to see period. It's the way it works. So you are sharing with strangers. Now these bullies, there will always be bullies until people start teaching their children that, hey, I did with my kids. When my kids pulled stunts like that, I gave them a dose of their own medicine and said, how do you like it? Is it fun? 
Does it make you feel good? I suggest you don't do that anymore. If you do, you're going to get another dose of it. I don't deal with that shit. You want to bully someone, you're going to get it right back at you. So long as people tolerate that kind of nonsense, or support it, or laugh at it, or how everyone look at it, it's going to continue. Stop it. Don't allow, you need to, you need to internalize that stuff. When you see someone out there being an obnoxious asshole to someone, or just digging at them, not necessarily being an obnoxious asshole, but just kind of digging. And then when that person gets upset, go, oh, it's just joking. Yeah, I was just joking my dying ass. Don't give me that shit. So number one, John, do not put that stuff out there. You do not have to expose yourself to the bullies because you know they're out there. I know you wish to be accepted for who you are, and that's wonderful, but don't throw it out there on social media for all the world to see. If you're concerned and you can't take the backlash of what you're putting out there, then don't put it out there, period. It really is that simple. Kitty cat, what did you get into? You're wet. You got a wet tummy. Goofy cat. Okay. So, back to this article. Many blogs exi exist on Tumblr showing support for maps, claiming that they should be part of the LGBT community and attempting to create safe spaces for these minor attracted persons. The blog Pedophiles for Pedophilia, which I started reading that one and I couldn't, I, I, yeah. It also presents many sob stories for marginalized pedophiles in some pretty pastel colors. Yes, it does, actually. Claiming that they mean no harm and just want to be loved like everyone. One, excuse me, hiccup, like everyone else, as shown in such headlines as Why Pedophilia and Pedophiles Are Not a Risk to Children. You repeat a lie often enough, and people will start believing it. Or how about this, Growing Up a Pedophile. How I Came Out as an Anti-Contact Pedophile to the Woman I Love. That's just messed. Now this name change seems to follow in the liberal trend of rebranding things by giving them more politically correct names. Basically, it's giving you a very vague, you know, oh, what does it stand? Minor attracted person. A minor attracted person could mean that, hey, I'm 21 and I, j I really dig this 16-year-old. A 16-year-old is classified as a minor in most places that I know of. Let me put that little bit there. Minor attracted person is very vague. And that's the kind of language you guys like to use. Very vague. We do not wish to normalize pedophilia. And I do feel bad for those people that grew up in that kind of an environment that um, they don't know any different. There are people out there that they don't know any different. And that's just wrong. So, let's see. Okay. Yay, Chloe. I'm catching up on the chat. There you go. Live and let live. You know, so long as I'm not causing intentional harm to another individual, I'm golden. That's the way I look at it. When I intentionally go set out to harm another individual, I have stepped over to the dark side. And that is not a good place to be. And sadly, there are an awful lot of people out there that seem to think that it's okay to... Uh, Oh, well, you know, I enjoy making them squirm. I enjoy causing them harm. You know, that's a sick individual. And that's someone that, that needs to have a brain flush. As in, flush all them little floaty thoughts out of their head. But, hmm. 
I really don't know a fix for this. There are just so many people out there that really have a messed up way of looking at life. From my perspective, we'll just put that out there. Okay, did I not, I did not do Elizabeth over on the effing site. I need to do that with the Monopoly thing. Okay, shall we play a game? I think that's what's been going on. We'll do that. Oh, okay. Now, I saw something else that was rather just almost well let me let me go here this is from the freethoughtproject.com and I saw this the other day and was always going to get around to it and it just never kind of fit into anything but now it does chilling NCMEC report shows 88% of missing sex trafficked kids come from US foster care isn't that just a lovely thought? They are spreading the love, assholios. Apparently, America has a dark secret that no one wants to admit. Well, one of many. It is that massive black elephant in the room, as in a big, big dark space in the room. So, <coughs> if you talk of this secret... It will get you labeled as a conspiracy theorist. Fake news and outlets who report on it will have their organic reach throttled by social media and Google alike. Now, despite the overwhelming evidence to the contrary, many of the mainstream media and government refuse to see this very ap epidemic of, or see this very real epidemic of child sex trafficking in the United States. What's more, according to the government's own data, the vast majority of the portion of these trafficked kids are coming from the country's own foster care system. Yeah, anytime you have some kind of system in the government that has care attached to it, you can pretty much bet your sweet bippy that there ain't no caring going on in there. Children are being needlessly ripped from homes at such an alarming rate that hundreds of parents in one state have gone so far as to create a counter-kidnapping organization to stop it. As TFTP reported last week, the Parents' Rights Organization filed a letter in federal court last Tuesday, which this article is dated June the 12th of this year, asking a federal judge to strike down Minnesota's current child protection laws for being too expansive and removing children from loving and safe homes without due process. Families are being abused and in some cases destroyed as a result of laws that are inappropriate, said Dwight Mitchell, who is the lead plaintiff in the case and founder of the Parents Association. This is legal kidnapping, which, yes, it is. And what's really sad is they go in and they pull those kids like crazy, but the ones that really, really, really need some help doesn't make a damn bit of difference if you report to them or if you try to step in and help or whatever. If you try and step in and help, your ass is in trouble. And if you report them, then you find out that, oh, this is only about the 10th or 15th or 20th time that this family has been reported and the child has been abused or children. And they keep returning those kids to the home. But you know those kids from families that, oh, maybe they're having a little bit of a rough go because both their parents got laid off and this wonderful economy that we've got going on. You know, or they're getting ready to have their house foreclosed on, or God knows what all. Maybe medical bills are going through the roof because, yeah, medical system, health care system, yeah. 
So when you have a, a situation where a family is a little bit strapped and they're doing the best that they can, or even families that are just doing the best that they can and they're not necessarily strapped, but somebody, some do-gooder, oh my God, they let their children play out on the front lawn without having parental observation. You should remove those children from that family because, by God, that's not safe. There are cases of that shit going on. Those are the kids that get put into the system and get shuttled around. It's, it's a freaking mess is what it is. In any case, back to this article. This legal kidnapping is happening in states across the country and it is contributing to the very real epidemic of child trafficking. Oh, well, Grammy, I know. I did say I bet my sweet bippy. I know. Okay. So the reality of such practices within the United States foster care system is outright horrifying. And yes, it is. In 1984, the United States Congress established the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. And as part of the Missing Children's Assistance Reauthorization Act of 2013, they received $40 million to study and track missing children and trafficked children in the United States. And they don't do doodly shit. Private people do better than any course. This is not surprising either. In 2017, NCMEC assisted law enforcement with over 27,000 cases of missing children and the majority who were considered endangered runaways. Now, according to the most recent report compiled by the FBI and from the FBI data, of the nearly 25,000 runaways reported to NCMEC in 2017, one in seven were likely victims of child sex trafficking. Of those, 88% were in the care of social services when they went missing. There's nothing social about it. So showing the scope of the abuse, in 2017 alone, NCMEC's Cyber Tip Line, which is a national mechanism for the public and electronic service providers to report instances of suspected child sexual exploitation, received over 10 million reports. And most of these tips were related to apparent, chi um, apparent child sexual abuse images, online enticement, including sextortion, child sex trafficking and child sexual molestation. Now other government organizations have corroborated this horrific trend and in 2013 FBI's 70 city nationwide raid 60 percent of the victims came from foster care or group homes. In 2014 New York authorities est estimated that 85 percent of sex trafficking victims were previously in the child welfare system. In 2012, Connecticut police rescued 88 children from sex trafficking. 86 were from the child welfare system. The system is either broken or it's doing exactly what it was designed to do. Equally as disturbing as the fact that most sex traffic kids come from within the system is the fact that the FBI discovered in 2014 nationwide raid that many foster children rescued from sex traffickers, including children as young as 11, were never reported missing by child welfare authorities. Can you say get in a cut of the action? So last year, TFTP reported on the example of this lack of reporting out of Topeka, Kansas. In a shocking report, the Kansas Department of Children and Families, or DCF, which oversees foster care in the state, were found to have lost 70 children after a high-profile case of three missing sisters garnered the attention of authorities. My home state. Y'all just keep making me proud, don't you? 
assholios. This has to stop. It should be noted that there are certain instances of abusive parents who should not have custody of their children. There are also many kind and loving foster parents willing to take them in. However, as the recent case in Minnesota highlights, many times these children are torn from loving homes and forced into a system rife with abuse and trafficking. One terrifying example of kids being unnecessarily taken from their parents by the state only to be severely harmed in government custody comes out of Arizona. The state kidnapped a five-year-old girl from her mother who had an alleged substance abuse problem and put her directly into the hands of a leader of a child sex ring. Even after the girl's mother recovered from her addiction, the state refused to return her daughter. Even worse, the mother found out that her daughter was being repeatedly sexually abused and no action was taken to remove her daughter from the state system. Sadly, children all over the U.S. are taken from caring parents who have admitted to using marijuana or other drugs. While there's no national count on how many parents lose custody of their kids each year due to marijuana, Keith Straup, who is the founder and organ of the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws, or NORMOL, told the Daily Chronic that his team gets calls three or four times a week from people who have lost custody of their children because they tested positive at birth or in a situation where parents are feuding over custody. And this kidnapping even occurs in regions where marijuana is legal. So legal don't mean dick to you peons. Just saying. Even high-level government officials have been ensnared in these foster care abuse scandals. As TFTP previously reported, multiple victims came forward and accused Seattle Mayor Ed Murray of sexually abusing them when they were children in Washington's foster care system. And the records of that case date back to 1984. Ex and they explicitly noted that Ed Murray should never again be utilized as a certified CSD resource for children. It also showed that a criminal case was brought against Murray by prosecutors, but in spite of the multiple accusations, charges were somehow never filed and his records were buried. As Snopes and the mainstream media in general attempts to smear those who try to call attention to the alleged and very real child trafficking, the government's own data shows how irresponsible this is. While there are certainly some outlandish theories being presented online, the facts are outlandish enough to warrant serious scrutiny. And until this epidemic is taken seriously, the government, the media, and all who deny it will remain complicit in keeping it going. As Michael Dolce, uh, who specializes in these child abuse cases, pointed out earlier this year, we have set up a system to sex traffic American children. And indeed we have. And it's not just American children. It, this is a global problem, but, you know, how's that freedom working out for you? You know, we are so free to be dumb. It's really, really sad. Okay. What? What are you guys talking about? Okay. Oh, Chloe, honey, you didn't see the whole discussion that we were having about racism. And Rob, Rob really pretty much explained it. I mean, his logic worked just fine for me. So, 
Apparently, if I'm a racist, that means that I love all races. That's not the way the rest of the world looks at it, but hey, it is kind of a bass Ackworth world, so. Okay. This is messed. Let me find. Let me find. Find, 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 find. I'm finding me just the perfect emoticon. Yeah, we'll do this. Because anything that has to do with state taking over this shit. Okay. Now, where is the other one? Yes. Yes. What can indigent, unemployed people do about it, Gooverzilla? If you see a wrong, speak out. Act out. Do something. Um, and sealing the damn borders. Honey, the only thing sealing the borders will do is it's not going to keep anybody out, but it will keep us in. Yeah, that border works both ways, as an outie and an innie. Just saying. Okay, so. Now, if you want to see just a little bit more of uh, what's coming down the pike, this is from Breitbart.com. UC Santa Barbara says four-year-old children should engage in sexual play. Now, I do believe I have covered this once before, but this is the mindset of some of these people. You know, and that's prob and probably some of these, I'm going to use this term very loosely, individuals have a tendency to um, think that, oh, but, you know, it's kind of like the... the that broad that said something about um, you shouldn't be calling a baby boy or a baby girl. You should call them a baby self or a toddler self until they are old enough to decide what their gender is. Really? Wow. Y'all are just freaking messed in the head. Um, but yeah, apparent, and, and I, I remember reading about this a couple weeks ago. Apparently, uh, UC Santa Barbara argues that children from ages 4 to 7 should engage in sexual play. And sexual play, as defined by the site, refers to acts as innocent as playing house and as sexual as touching their peers' genitals. Now, wait a minute here. You guys are the same ones that cry foul and sexual harassment when you have a child go up and hug a peer. That child must be suspended from school because they touched them in an inappropriate manner. What the hell? Okay, I get that, Goober. Let's see. So, you know, I... Did, uh, You know, you really don't have to teach children about sexual play. I had children. I will just leave it at that. Children don't need to be taught about it. They do need to be questioned when they get caught at it. <laughs> Why are you doing such things? Don't go off the handle and start screaming and hollering and smacking them with a belt or with your hand or whatever the hell. Sit down and ask them questions. Talk to them about it and then let them know that, you know, that really is not something that is appropriate. Although appropriate is a rather big word for a four or five year old. But. <sighs> there are so many. So many nimrods in this world. Okay. So now that I have, no pun intended, touched on that nastiness, um, where is that other one? Here we go. You know, these are the same people that push this stuff. 
And this is also, I believe, from the dailymail.co.uk. And let's see if they're going to kick my ass on this one, or was it the other one? Christian doctor is sacked by the government for refusing to identify patients by their preferred gender because he believes sex is established at birth. Okay, actually, it's established in the womb, but mm, nobody really knows till they come out of the Play-Doh fun factory of life. So a doctor has been fired from a top government role for suggesting gender is determined at birth. Dr. David Makarith, who is 55, who has worked as an NHS doctor for 26 years, was deemed to be unfit to work after he said he would refuse to identify patients by their preferred gender. Now, the senior doctor has set, uh, was set to become a disability assessor for the Department of Work and Pensions uh, claim he claims a person's gender is biological excuse me and said his right to freedom of speech has been denied which yes gender is biological duh XY chromosomes or a few other combinations but mm, those are rarities the media or the medic from Dudley in the West Midlands fears other professional people of faith could lose their jobs simply for holding opinions about gender that are centuries old. And you don't even have to be a person of faith, just a person of logic. Now, Dr. Makarith um, says it is his religious belief and the medic who spent most of his career in accident and emergency wards said, I'm not attacking the transgender movement but I'm defending my right to freedom of speech and freedom of belief. I don't think I should be compelled to use a specific pronoun. I'm not setting out to upset anyone, but if upsetting someone can lead to doctors being sacked, then as a society, we have to examine where we are going. So, his role would have involved compiling independent reports about the health of those he interviewed who were claiming disability benefits. But matters began to sour when his instructor said reports must only refer to the patient or client by the gender that person self-identifies as. So if you've got a 57-year-old man with chronic back issues, but he self-identifies as a 7-year-old girl, it happens. I said that I had a problem with this, and I believe that gender is defined by biology and genetics, and that as a Christian, the Bible teaches us that God made humans male or female. I should have kept my mouth shut, but it was the right time, or it was the right time to raise it. Okay, he didn't really need to add the whole Christian thing to it, but eh. It was his choice. The uh, tutor passed on his comments, and Dr. McGrath received an email from APM, the agency employing him, stating that the DWP was adamant that any report or contact with clients should refer to people in their chosen sex, or it could be considered harassment as defined by the 2010 Equality Act. So see, once again, they are trying to legislate morality, or lack thereof, and legislate unhurt feelings, emotional boo-boo brigade. The doctor replied that in good conscience he could not conform to those demands, and so the contract was terminated. Now he said, firstly... We are not allowed to say what we believe. Secondly, as my case shows, we are not allowed to think what we believe. And finally, we're not allowed to defend what we believe. Kind of like Holocaust deniers in Germany get to go to jail. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Oh, wait, that's Monopoly. Never mind. The DWP spokeswoman said that the Equality Act made it unlawful to discriminate on grounds of a protected characteristic, such as gender reassignment. Now, this whole amorphic protected characteristic shit 
Let's be vague, shall we? Oh, let's add another protected. You know, you have to be a special kind of cupcake in order to get protected status. She also added that Dr. Makarath made it clear during his training that he would refuse to use pronouns which did not match his own view of a person's biological gender. Really? We expect all assessors to handle assessments sensitively, sensitively and adhere to the Equality Act 2010. And the APM declined to comment. So, apparently, it's not really so much his faith base as it is that he just said, no, you're either male or female and I'm not going with this other shit. Um, what? Okay. Dun, dun, dun. What did the Russians do this time? Them damn Rushkis. I know Grimmy Cupcakes. Cupcakes. <laughs> Let me put this over here on the effing site. Real fast. This is just going to be one of those. The world is freaking whacked. In the noodle. It really is. And this shit. Is like. What? I'm just. I'm, I'm going to have an awful lot of the smack of my head kind of damn and here's another one and it's a Ben Shapiro it's from townhall.com and I saw a meme about this earlier and I thought what I've never heard of this gal which is okay but from townhall.com when abortion becomes a sacrament really hmm I, I had seen that, that, you know, they keep spinning the wheel of offensive. This is offensive. Well, apparently. Or this is what we need to go off the deep end over this time. They're all distractions, y'all. But I'm, I'm giving them 15 seconds more of fame. So, apparently this week, amid widespread Democratic tumult regarding the selection of a replacement for Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy... Alleged comedian Michelle Wolf paid tribute to the most important facet of American life, abortion. And on her Netflix show on Sunday, she dressed up in red, white, and blue and shrieked into the camera, God bless abortions and God bless America. Which, hey, sweetheart, you know, that's, that's your thing. Deal with the repercussions of your thing. She also explained, women, if you need an abortion, get one. If you want an abortion, get one. And women, don't forget, you have the power to give life, and men will try to control that. Don't let them. Well, it takes two to make that baby, sweetheart, number one. And stop and think. You would not be here if your mother had the same mindset as you do, darling. Now, along with her inane outburst, she justified abortion itself. Look, she stated, access to abortion is good and important. Some people say abortion is killing a baby. It's not. It's stopping a baby from happening, which, uh, killing, killing. Oh, but yeah, you know, the, you don't get to hear the juicy side where they get to, you know, take all of those little bits and pieces and parts and use it for medical experimentation or put it into shit or what have you. Yeah. Harvesting of that medical, um, how do they call that? Uh, medical byproduct. Medical waste byproduct. Yeah, that's probably terminology they would use. Well, some people say that Michelle Wolf is killing comedy, and she's not. She's stopping comedy from happening, which, yeah, I, I didn't find that amusing at all. But, you know, I, and I have a dark sense of humor, but that's just one of those things where it's like, really? Mm. 
Ben goes on to say, but more importantly, a ground shift has taken place in how Democrats think about abortion. Back in 2005, I wrote that the Democratic safe, legal, and rare formulation regarding abortion was logically and morally untenable. If Democrats wanted abortion to be rare thanks to its inherent immorality, there was no reason for it to be legal. Democrats have finally come around and now they're shouting their abortions, proclaiming them from the rooftops, suggesting that there is a moral good achieved by abortion. Sweetheart, if you really don't want to get pregnant, keep your frickin' legs together. And on the rare occasions where there is incest or rape, there is the morning after pill. Quit stigmatizing people that actually have gone through that to where they feel comfortable enough to come forward and get taken care of before, before impregnation even happens. But, you know, if you want to just go around willy-nilly dipping all kinds of wicks into your well and all of a sudden something shows up in your womb, well, this is inconvenient. I can't have this. I'm much too busy having wicks dipped in my well. He goes on to say, Thus, Lena uh, Dunham said just two years ago, I still haven't had an abortion, but I wish I had. Really? And Chelsea Handler, who has had two abortions, explained in the pages of Playboy, I don't ever look back and think, God, I wish I'd had that baby. Her article was accompanied by a picture of a woman's hand with a raised middle finger with a pink bow around it. And attached to the bow is a small card that reads, It's an abortion. Yeah, and you know, have you seen that meme of the little teenage girl who's looking down at her tummy and holding her tummy and there's a little thought bubble above it that says, Oh my God, my mom's going to kill me. And there's a thought bubble coming from the tummy that says, Oh my God, my mom's going to kill me. Yes, abortion is now a sig signifier that you refuse to be ruled by the patriarchy. Oh, good for you. If you refuse to be ruled by the patriarchy, quit going around and letting them dip their wick in your... what? <laughs> Avoidance of pregnancy may be a wise life choice. And according to third wave feminists, preventing women from being sucked into the grinding maw of maternal life. But abortion is something even better. It's a signal that you just don't care about the system. The system demands that if you're pregnant with a child, you make your own concerns secondary, and the system must be fought. Nah, it's not a system thing. Gloria Steinem once remarked that if men could get pregnant, abortion would be a sacrament. But modern-day feminists have determined that abortion is a sacrament, specifically because women can get pregnant, showing that control over your body even extends to the killing of your unboiled, unborn child is a way of standing up against patriarchal concerns with women as the source of future generations. For Michelle Wolf, abortion is just another decision. It's a giant middle finger to the moral establishment. And those who would fight abortion are... Um, desacralizing the mysterious holiness of the ritual that reinforces women's control. No wonder Wolf thinks God blesses abortion. Abortion is her God. And you know what? You want to give the middle finger to the moral establishment? I can tell you what you can do with that middle finger and then that you definitely will not get pregnant. Just saying. <sighs> okay, I think I've had my fill of this. Uh. The world has gone freaking mad. It really has. And life apparently is not valued anymore. Oh. 
and you have people like this who seem to think they're funny, guess what? You're not, darling. Not one bit amusing. At least not to me. So, let me go back into my pocket. And this is something that I stuck in my pocket last week. Um. <laughs> Thanks, Sock. Um. Okay, so this is from the onion.com. So you know it's going to be true. It's going to be true. And it's from March of 2013 in their news section. God worried that he fucked up his children. You think? Now the heavens are saying that maybe he wasn't around enough and could have expressed his divine love a little better throughout the history of mankind. Our Lord God and Almighty Father expressed concern Thursday that he might have fucked up his children. In a frank conversation with reporters, God said that it's not hard to see that all seven billion of his children are pretty screwed up and that many of them are hopelessly maladjusted and unfit to live healthy, normal lives. I love my sons and daughters equally. But was I present as much as I could have been? Probably not, said the divine creator, pointing to the human race's emotional volatility, existential angst, and lack of any real direction as evidence of his failure. Ever since I molded them in my image, I've tried to do right by them. I really have. But they're just so dysfunctional that I'm starting to wonder if I'm to blame. Well, you created us in your own image, hon. God claimed that though he always made sure to provide his children with food, water, air to breathe, and an earth to live on, he was starting to realize that material things weren't nearly enough. In addition, while God repeatedly said that he loved his children, the Lord our Maker admitted that he could have said it more often. Moreover, God told reporters that he was also beginning to regret his hands-off approach, saying that giving his children complete free will was probably a mistake. And I always thought that if I let them stray from the path of righteousness and goodwill, that they'd learn how to get back on their own, the Eternal One said. But maybe that was just laziness on my part. The truth is, I was so busy ruling the universe and controlling heaven and earth, well, that there were times that I was basically invisible to my children. I know that now. No wonder they're running around breaking every single commandment I gave them, he continued. They needed an almighty ruler who was really there for them. Not some deadbeat heavenly father who would just appear in a divine vision from time to time and then just split. Now the author of our eternal salvation added that he had passed down a number of bad habits. He was starting to see in his children, particularly... A shared inclination for senseless destruction and unpredictability. And violent outbursts. I haven't been the best example at times, said God, admitting that his propensity for flooding and disease and famine have uh, screwed with his children's heads for centuries. I've put my sons and daughters through some pretty traumatic events especially recently. And that's exactly the kind of thing that makes them act out in the first place. I mean, they see me destroy Indonesia with a tsunami and kill six million of my own children in Europe. And what do you think that does to them? Probably fucks them up pretty good. So... 
While God admitted that he had made many mistakes in his upbringing that would no doubt leave them permanently scarred, the Supreme Being told reporters that he hasn't yet or wasn't yet ready to give up on his flock. The fact is, my children only have one God, and it's my responsibility to make sure that they shape up and reach their full potential. Then again, a lot of them are so beyond screwed up at this point that there's probably nothing I can do for them. Yeah, pretty much. But at least you admit it. At least you admit it, big guy. Give everybody a big old noogie. Okay. Y'all are doing all kinds of middle fingers over here in the chitty chat. You naughty, naughty people, you. Okay, you know what? It is time to go check out the pig. See what happened this date in history and see what else those wacky guys are up to. Because, yeah, the show's pretty much been whacked. So, old kaboom is going to... Zzz, I need a... Is there a kaboom smiting thing? <laughs> okay. I need to... I need to figure out a kaboom smitey. Grammy, is there a kaboom smite? I don't see a kaboom smitey in the... In the and I'm not going to ask you to go ahead and put one in there because... Yeah, it may not be there for long. <laughs> But, okay, we'll just do this. And do that, because, yeah, God gave us gas, too. Just saying. Okay, to the pig. Pig, 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 pig. You politically incorrect guys, you. Over here on PIGazette.com, what are Porcus and Hambo up to today? Their word of the day is the sun. It's a big, hot, round thing in the daytime, which, despite compelling scientific evidence to the contrary, the fat cave fathead insists has nothing to do with Earth's warming and cooling cycles. Although, if you stop and look at the science of what they tell us of the, all of this shit, during summer, for us is when we are the farthest away from the sun. How does that work out? Weird. Huh. In the quotable quotes section, then we get a Kavanaugh. I've never seen a campaign for a Supreme Court justice to be nominated as aggressive, as nasty, as ruthless, and as dishonest as the campaign behind Kavanaugh. That's not to say he wouldn't make a good justice, but there are questions. That was from Mark Levine. Yes. That's okay, Grimmy. I don't need a smite emoji. I'm I've I've moved beyond my smiting. Okay. What what what? Okay. This is in their tasty tidbits. I gotta do this because it goes a while and it's like what? It's 17 inches. 21 years ago, in Nashville, Tennessee, during the first week of January 1996, more than 4,000 basketball coaches descended upon the Opry Ho Opryland Hotel for the 52nd annual ABCA's convention. Now, while I waited in line to register with the hotel staff, I heard other more veteran coaches rumbling about the lineup of speakers scheduled to present during the weekend. One name in particular kept resurfacing, always with the same sentiment. John Scalinus is here. Oh man, worth every penny of my airfare. So who is John Scalinus, I wondered. No matter, I was just happy to be there. Well, in 1996, Coach Scalinus, and I'm probably mispronouncing this, was 78 year old and five years retired from college coaching career that began in 1948. He shuffled to the stage to an impressive standing ovation wearing dark polyester pants, a light blue shirt, 
and a string around his neck from which a home plate hung. A full-sized, stark white home plate. So, after speaking for 25 minutes, not once mentioning the prop hanging around his neck, Coach appeared to notice the snickering among some of the coaches. Even those who knew that Coach had to wonder exactly where he was going with this or if he had simply forgotten about the home plate since he'd gotten on stage. Then finally, you're probably all wondering why I'm wearing home plate around my neck, he said, as his vo voice growing irascible. I laughed along with the others and acknowledged the possibility that I may be old, but I'm not crazy. The reason I stand before you today is to share with you, baseball people, what I've learned in my life and what I've learned about home plate. Oh, I, did I say basketball before? It should be baseball. So, several hands went up when Scolinas asked um, how many Little League coaches were in the room. Now, do you know how wide home plate is in Little League? And after a pause, someone offered 17 inches. That's right, he said. And how about Babe Ruth's day? Any Babe Ruth coaches in the house? And another long pause. 17 inches, a guess from another one. And that's right, said Scolinas. So how many high school coaches do we have in the room? And hundreds of hands shot up. And as the pattern began to appear, how wide is home plate in high school baseball? 17 inches, they said, sounding confident. You're right, he answered. And the college coaches, how wide is home plate in college? 17 inches, they said in unison. In minor league coaches here, how wide is home plate in pro ball? 17 inches. To which he responded, right. And in Major League, how wide is home plate in Major Leagues? 17 inches. And what do they do with a big league pitcher who can't throw a ball over 17 inches? To which there was a pause and then he said, they sent him to Ponticello. And what they don't do is this. They don't say, Ah, oh, that's okay, Jimmy. If you can't hit a 17-inch target, we'll make it 18 inches or 19 inches. We'll make it 20 inches so you have a better chance of hitting it. If you can't hit that, let us know so we can make it wider still. Let's say 25 inches. And then there was a pause. And then he continued, Coaches, what do we do when your best player shows up late to practice? Or when our team rules forbid facial hair and a guy shows up unshaven? What if he gets caught drinking? Do we hold him accountable? Or do we change the rules to fit him? Do we widen home plate? Well, the chuckles gradually faded as 4,000 coaches grew quiet and the fog lifting as the old coach's message began to unfold. He turned the plate towards himself and using a sharpie began to draw something and when he turned it towards the crowd, pointed up, um, yeah, point up, a house was revealed, complete with a freshly drawn door and two windows. This is the problem in our homes today. With our marriages, with the way our parent, we parent our kids, with our discipline, we don't teach kids accountability. And there is no consequence for failing to meet standards. We just widen the plate. Then to the point at the top of the house, he added a small American flag. This is the problem in our schools today. The quality of our education is going downhill fast and teachers have been stripped of the tools that they need to be successful.
and to educate and discipline our young people. We are allowing others to widen home plate. So where is that getting us? And then he replaced the flag with a cross. And this is the problem in the church where powerful people in position of authority have taken advantage of young children, only to have such an atrocity swept under the rug for years. Our church leaders are widening home plate for themselves, and we allow it. And the same is true with our government. Our so-called representatives make rules for us that don't apply to themselves. They take bribes from lobbyists in foreign countries. They no longer serve us, and we allow them to widen home plate. We see our country falling into a dark abyss while we just watch. So I was amazed at a baseball convention where I expected to learn something about curveballs and bunting and how to run better practices. I'd learn something far more valuable from an old man with home plates strung around his neck. I'd learned something about life and about myself and about my own weaknesses and about my responsibilities as a leader. I had to hold myself and others accountable to that which I knew to be right, lest our families, our faith, and our society continue down an undesirable path. If I'm lucky, Coach or if I'm lucky, Coach Scalinas concluded, you will remember one thing from this old coach today. It is this. If we fail to hold ourselves to a higher standard, a standard of what we know to be right, if we fail to hold our spouses and our children to the same standards, if we are unwilling or unable to provide a consequence when they do not meet the standard, and if our schools and churches and our government fail to hold themselves accountable to those they serve, there is but one thing to look forward to. And with that he held home plate in front of his chest, turned it around, and revealed its dark backside. We have dark days ahead. Now the coach died in 2009 at the age of 91 but not before touching the lives of hundreds of players and coaches, including mine. Meeting him at my first ABCA convention kept me returning year after year, looking for similar wisdom and inspiration from other coaches. He is the best clinic speaker of the ABCA has ever known because he was so much more than a baseball coach. His message was clear. Coaches, Keep your players, no matter how good they are, your own children, your churches, your government, and most of all, keep yourself at 17 inches. And this, my friends, is what's wrong with our country and has become what is wrong with it today. Now, time to go out there and fix it. And don't widen the plate. Excellent advice. We do keep widening the plate, don't we? Making excuses and allowances for ourselves and for others. Okay, this date in history, the 11th of July, 1804. Politics becomes a blood sport when Burr kills Hamilton in a duel. And this date in history, the 11th of July, 1812, U.S. invades Canada, takes a look around, laughs, gives it right back. <laughs> okay, I needed that chuckle. Thank you ever so much, Hambo and Porkus. And if you guys want to read more, come on over to PIGazette.com. Say hey to Hambo and Porkus. They've got all kinds of wonderful links off to the sides. And... Uh, they have the Pig Prattler page, which always has funnies, and Hambo's Hammer and Porcus's Pitchfork, so where they just kind of do their own venting. So go on over and check them out. A triple dog dare ya. So, let's see. We've had the onion. 
I wonder what else is going on. Over here on the onion. Do you guys have some more funnies here? Um, I'm going to check out their opinion. Nope. Nope. Don't want to go there. Um, no. I'm pretty much done with that. I didn't see anything on there that was just really, really calling to me and saying, you need to read this. So, let's see. Done that, done that, done that. I need to clean out my pocket. <laughs> um, let's see. Not real. Okay. This one is from the 4th of July. Um, the Epoch Times dot com. Don't know if I'm really going to get into it or not. It's just something that I was like, hmm. So what does patriotism mean to you? Hmm, that's a tough question. On July 4th, 1776, 13 colonies spanning the East Coast from Massachusetts to Georgia adopted the U.S. Declaration of Independence, announcing themselves independent of British rule. War, however, raged on for another six years. Finally, in 1782, the British Parliament agreed to end all offensive operations in North America, giving Americans their first real taste of nationhood. And when all was said and done... And an estimated 6,800 Americans were excuse me, killed in combat and roughly 17,000 more died from disease during the War of Independence. Now, the 4th of July is a day of barbecues and fireworks and also reflecting on what it means to be American, which is not nearly as pretty as it... I don't know if it's ever really been pretty. When you look back, although I am using my own moral compass to judge others... 200 and some odd years ago. So, here is what some citizens from Los Angeles to New York had to say when asked, what does patriotism mean to you? And there is, apparently, a video of this. So, where liberty dwells, there is my country. That was Benjamin Franklin. So, there is a video attached to this, so if you wish to check it out, go right ahead. Um, Kavanaugh threatens to... Yeah, MAPS is widening the plate, Frumpy. So is LGBT. So is any of this other I identify as... Because nobody seems to believe me when I tell them I identify as a multi-bazillionaire. Nobody seems to go ahead and coddle me when it comes to that kind of shit. So if I can't have it, nobody can. <laughs> okay. I'm going to put this over on the effing site as well. And then I think I'm just going to, I only have a little bit left, looks like 18 minutes. So, I think I will go to Oopy, see what's going on over on Oopy. Because I think I've gotten to everything else that I intended to over the last few days. Hmm, 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 hmm. We'll do, let's see, yeah, do this one, okay. So, what is going on on Oopy? And I may have to check out a couple other sites that I haven't been to for a while as well. So, burglar trapped inside escape room bis... <laughs> oh, there you go. Um, 
Let's see. Ooh, we'll just go there. This is from today. Apparently, a burglar um, got trapped inside an escape room business and calls 911. Good one. Authorities in Oregon said a burglar found 911 when he found himself in an ironic situation. Trapped inside an escape room business. The Clark County Sheriff's Office said deputies responded to a 911 call at about 4 a.m. from a man who broke into Northwest Escape Experience in Vancouver and discovered he was unable to get back out again. Investigators said that the man took a phone, a TV remote, and a beer from the business fridge before discovering that he had damaged the back door while breaking in and was unable to leave through it. The sheriff said that he had a burrito and was sitting or was settling in to have a breakfast and beer, um, I guess, that, and a beer, I guess, and then got scared because he couldn't get out. So the suspect gave dispatchers a false story about breaking into the business to call for help because his home had been broken into, and he gave dispatchers a fake address. The man did manage to get out of the building before police arrived, but he was found outside the strip mall and arrested. So, we started thinking about it, and yeah, it's really funny, said Bertrand. And I'm proud to say that I'm the only escape room in north in the northwest that has a 100 percent capture rate of criminals well but it was a it was a catch and release kind of thing hun because he did get out but that is kind of kind of funny serves him right what's that obama officials freak out after trumple stilson calls out oh you know, I used to really enjoy Breitbart. And then Andrew died. And then things started going downhill. Hmm. Okay. In the animal kingdom. And there is a video attached to this. A squirrel ejects an invading owl from its tree nest. This was over in Britain. A British homeowner who set up a camera next to a squirrel's tree nest captured a moment the rodent came home to eject a trespassing owl. The video filmed outside of the home in Thixendale, England, shows an owl approach a tree, climb into the hole that houses the squirrel's nest. The footage shows the squirrel arrive back in the tree and climb inside, and moments later, the owl appears at the entrance again and leaves with the squirrel shoving it from behind. So, hey, there you go. I said, you out of here. Leave my nuts alone. Who do you think you are? <laughs> hoo hoo. Oh, that's just silliness. See, when I squirrel, it's because I started doing one thing and then I went, ooh, that needs done. And next thing you know, I'm off on 20 other tangents. I have been known to do that. I know you're shocked. Okay, we'll go back to Oopy and see what else is going on in here. Ew. Um, hmm. Ontario man is selling a six-year-old McDonald's food on eBay. You suppose he's making any money out of it? Ew. Apparently he is offering an unusual set of items on eBay. It's a McDonald's cheeseburger and fries that spent six years on a shelf. Ew. Yuck. So, Dave Alexander posted a listing on the auction website for a six-year-old burger and fries, which he said were never eaten or even refrigerated. Ew, looks nasty. The fries are stunningly good-looking. I don't know. And the fries look like they were purchased this morning. Uh, uh, wow, dude, where do you go to McDonald's? Uh, never mind, I haven't been inside of one of those places in years. 
The burger itself is darkened a little bit, and the bun is about as hard as a hockey puck, but it looks just like it's brand new cosmetically. Alexander said that he, um, he had his daughter buy him the burger and fries on June the 6th, 2012, so he could put them on the shelf in his home and determine whether rumors that McDonald's food doesn't decompose were mere urban legend. He said that the homemade burger and fries placed next to the fast food items five years ago have been rotting as expected. The cheese on the homemade one, especially the french fries, the potatoes, just look like little bits of charcoal right now. But the McDonald's burger and fries started at $22.91 and bids reached $62.65 on Friday with six days remaining in the auction. We live in the country, and we've never seen a fly land on it, ever, he said. And yeah, that just looks nasty. Just another reason why I have not been into a McDonald's. And yeah, Grim, that squirrel is lucky that the owl didn't eat him. That's usually what... But it must have been a very small owl, I'm thinking. Okay. Let's see. <laughs> okay. Two more really weird ones. Really weird ones. And then I'm going to be out of here. This is also from UPI. I'm just going to let you guys peruse UBI because that's pretty much what I'm doing. A giant straw squirrel raises controversy in Kazakhstan. A giant straw squirrel. So what kind of straws was it made out of? It's a squirrel. It's a 40-foot squirrel sculpture assembled from straw. In the Kazakhstan city is promoting or it is prompting backlash from the public due to its $67,000 price tag. Wow! If that's straw as in hay, that's a hell of a lot of hay bales. The oversized squirrel created by South African sculptor Maurice Johnson Van Vuren and British artist Alex Rinsler, Rinsler was partially paid for with about $43,000 $576 worth of public funds as part of the Art Energy Festival in Almaty, which features more than a dozen other artworks. Now, the sculpture drew criticism from some locals who suggested that the public funds could have been put to better use, you know, helping the cash-strapped locals with medical expenses and other costs, while some others branded the straw sculpture as a fire hazard, which, yeah, it kind of is. But the squirrel also has its fans, with some residents saying that it brings smiles to the faces of local children. So obviously it was for the children. Now the artist behind the squirrel who created a similar straw fox in Shanghai said that the straw sculpture is being designed to change appearance as it faces weather and other forces during the nine months on out display outdoors. So, okay, so it will get to be a darker squirrel and a more shriveled squirrel. 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 Okay, and one more from Oopy. Gosh, I'm going to have... Okay, now this one is just freaking creepy. Or at least the headline is. Man finds snake eating his wife's lingerie in the bedroom. Ew. Apparently this was in Thailand and uh, he captured a video of the snake that he found in the bedroom that had partially swallowed a piece of his wife's lingerie. Hmm. This uh, gentleman said that he arrived at his home in Uban. Yeah, he arrived at his home and discovered a golden tree snake was in his bedroom. The husband pulled on the snake's tail and discovered that the reptile had swallowed a large section of his wife's pink silk nightie. 
I think the snake felt a little bit sick. It's not the normal food that they eat, and it would have been very difficult for him to digest this. He could have had problems if we didn't pull it out. And the video shows him pulling on the snake's tail, causing it to regurgitate the lingerie. Hmm, I'm just wondering what kind of aroma the lingerie had going on that made the snake think, oh, that's tasty. Oof. Woofty. I don't know that I want, oof. Thank God I don't live in Thailand. That's just freaking creepy. So. Okay. Oopie. Oopie, oopie. That's pretty much it for you. I still got time. What the hey? So let's see. Where else can I go? Hmm. Do I want to go to... Let's go to alternativenews.com, shall we? Hey, natural news. Guess what? I said hey to BB earlier today and uh, talked about the laundry soap that I use. And right there up top in there, um, natural news section from naturalnews.com, how to make your own laundry soap. There you go. There you go. Unlike store-bought laundry detergent, DIY laundry soap doesn't use toxic chemicals to clean your clothes. So when shit hits the fan, you'll benefit from knowing how to make your own laundry soap. Even when things are relatively calm, you can make DIY laundry soap to save money on cleaning products. Because trust me, um, yeah, you're paying, mostly if you buy the liquid, you're paying for water in your laundry soap, basically. So, you can make laundry soap in either solid powder form or liquid form. And they can be effective or effectively used to clean clothing. Yes, who's flashing me? That is a nasty snake. <laughs> That's not a trouser snake, Grammy. That's a nasty snake. So, the actual amount may vary on the prices of the, ing of the ingredients in your area, but you can make about 20 gallons of homemade laundry soap for only $10. Yes, yes, that is true. So the basics to keep in mind if you decide to start using DIY laundry soap is both liquid and powdered laundry soaps are extremely shelf stable when stored properly. Now a bottle of liquid homemade laundry soap can be used even after seven months. Meanwhile powdered DIY laundry soap in an airtight container will keep for a long time. And like a lot of other homemade bar and liquid soaps, DIY laundry soap is low sudsing and it's normal not to see that many bubbles when you're washing clothes. It doesn't mean that the soap isn't working. So you can skip the essential oils if you're only using DIY laundry soap for baby or pet clothes. And the ingredients like essential oils can be too harsh for sensitive skin unless you only do a drop or two. That may not be a problem. It just, you know, and basically I put the essential oils in because, well, I like the smell. So, um, to avoid buildup in your septic system or your energy efficient washer, add a couple tablespoons of Epsom salt when doing a load of laundry. Using, when you use liquid laundry soap instead of the powdered DIY soap recipes, which I occasionally just run vinegar through my washing machine because I do the liquid. Uh, when doing a large load of laundry, two tablespoons is usually the rec amount, recommended amount of homemade laundry soap per large load. Um, that applies to both liquid and powdered, although I do tend to use a little bit more than that. Um, you can use distilled white vinegar as a natural fabric softener, and it won't make your laundry smell like vinegar, and it doesn't, trust me. You just, uh, just don't add the vinegar to your wash if you're using homemade laundry soap that has baking soda in it, or Castile soap, or super washing soda. Combining the vinegar with these ingredients might ruin the load of laundry, and yeah, it might, which is why I just, 
I don't do vinegar in that part. So, the uh, recipe for this is, um, let's see. Well, you can use whatever kind of soap you want for making your laundry detergent. Some brands are better than others. Now, I will tell you that I use Fells Naphtha. The three bar soaps that you use, which you grate them up in order to make your soap. Uh, Castile is an olive oil based soap from Spain and it's often used to make laundry soap, dish soap, and liquid hand soap and it's good at removing both dirt and stains from clothing. Since Castile is a vegetable fat based, it has a low chance of clogging up your washer or your septic system. Now I have used Fels Naphtha but I do have Castile and basically I need to, I may have to try some Castile the next because I need to make another batch. Um, so Fels Naphtha, unlike Castile, is usually more readily available and it's cheaper and it doesn't have any added perfumes and it's highly concentrated so it lasts a long time on gentle skin. Or you can use ivory soap. So the ingredients are, because I'm running out of time, one bar of soap, two cups of borax, and two cups of washing soda water and a five gallon bucket. Now I have actually done two bars of soap this last batch and that works really well for you know working out in the dirt or grease or whatever so but it also makes it stretch farther too so six of one half a dozen of the other. So you cut the soap into chunks or you grate it with a cheese grater and then you heat up two quarts of water in a large pot Pour the grated soap into the pot, stirring it constantly until the soap dissolves. Remove the pot from the stove and pour four and a half gallons of warm water into the bucket, which that's not necessarily how I do it, but eh. And you stir in both the washing soda and the borax until the particles in the mixture are fully dissolved. Then add the soap mixture to the bucket. You'll need at least um, half to one full cup of laundry soap per load depending on how dirty the clothes is but uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share this and an all-natural bleach alternative is one and a half cups of three percent hydrogen peroxide one half cup of lemon juice and 12 cups of filtered water so that is a non-toxic bleach and it will yield a gallon of that so I have gone over my time. So, thanks y'all for listening in to Grammy's Rocket Chair. And there you go, a little tidbit for you to make your own laundry soap and save you buku bunches of money. I will be back on Friday for the Freaker Friday edition of Grammy's Rocket Chair. But until then, please be sure to check out Vinny with the Ponder Gander at uh, 1 o'clock Eastern Time on Friday. He kicks off the Friday festivities. I kick off the Friday evening festivities. But until then, y'all have an absolutely amazing rest of your evening. I hope tomorrow is just absolutely splendiferous, and I will catch you on the flip side. Please remember, I truly do love you all, and I wish you all enough. Now use that laundry soap recipe and clean up your act. Good night.